All right. Well, welcome back to Digging Deeper. And you have a happy host today on Digging Deeper. And that is what there's a reason why I'm a happy host. And that's because I have looked at my weather app. And there are just raindrops for the next like 10 days. Wow. That's pretty and good. I'm excited. You like rain? I love rain. Right. I do not like rain. You do not like oh. main reason why? I know. I just like sun, man. Uh, he's a rain but, hater. But I know we need it. I know we need yeah, the rain. I'm need thank, thank God for it. But Southern, oh, yes. Southern Californian in you coming out. Man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is. It is. Yep. Yep. The Southern Oregonian in me loves it. Mm. Uh, and yes, we do need it. So, all right. If you attend River Valley, you are familiar with people to my left and my right. To my left, Michael Bond. How are you doing? Doing good, Tim, and you? I am doing well. All right, man. And to my right, the Reverend Mark Goins. How are you, Mark? Good, good, man. (laughs) Reverend Dr. Mark Goins. I don't think I've ever been on a Digging Deeper with Michael Bond. You haven't, and I am excited. Buckle up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be wild. Uh, Yes, I was thinking, man, how do I start this? Tim and the Big Dogs or what? But I didn't think you guys would appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, here we are, and... um, Michael and I have a lot of differences in our life. I'm a Niners fan. He's a Seahawks fan. That's yet true. We put that aside. Go Rams. Yeah, and we have a Rams fan. <laughs> uh, NFC West. Yeah. Strong representation today. <laughs> Michael and I aren't throwing a lot of shade at each other because, quite frankly, our teams just aren't doing very well. No, they're so. at the bottom of the division. It's not good. <laughs> yes. Um, however, we aren't here to talk football, although I would have a I'd lot of fun doing that. Well. Um, we're talking about John the Baptist, kind mm. of a, a part two. We talked about him a little bit last week. Um, and a question was posed last week that I want to ask you guys: Was John the Baptist weird? <laughs> what do you think, Mark? You know, he he gets that rap, but I just think he was like countercultural. You know, I mean, his parents were establishment elite religious, right? They were from the line of Aaron. He goes kind of the sort of the opposite of that. Becomes probably an Essene, lived out in the desert, mm-hmm. probably was a Nazarite. And so because of that, he would abstain from a lot of things, had an interesting diet, <laughs> and um, long hair, and that kind of thing. So weird, just just different because of his vows. Yeah, so, but, so weird, but like also you can't look away, right? Like just so interesting and intriguing person, you just can't look away. I don't know, man. I'm thinking of another W word. I'm thinking uh, not weird, but willing. Mm. Uh, he, he was willing. He's mm-hmm. like a, such a good example for all of us. He was w- willing to go where other people didn't want to go. He was willing to say what other people wouldn't say. And we'll talk about that as we get into this. But I, I just see such a willingness to live. It's it's pretty inspiring. Right. Us. Well, and, you know, the we laugh about the clothes, camel's hair, and the locusts that he <laughs> ate. And, the, and, and that, that was more just like a simple life, you know, more of like just kind of poor, you know, lived very much like a prophet in the Old Testament, not like the fat cats in in Jerusalem, you know, and the, the wealth that sort of accompanied the religious establishment in Jerusalem. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we actually uh, stumble upon a little rendezvous, a little interaction between him and the Pharisees. So that's going to take up kind of the first part of this podcast. I'm going to, uh, I have Mark representing the Pharisees, Michael <laughs> representing John the Baptist, and oh, that man. in no way, shape, or form is implying... How so you, I feel about you. Pick you pick me for the weird part, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know which one you'd want to be, the weird guy or the people that got it all wrong. Or the but, establishment. Um, the man. So yeah, there's a little back and forth. And Mark, I want to start with you. So uh, these Pharisees, where would they have come from? And then uh, they kind of ask him, are you this guy? Are you this guy? Are you this guy? Are you, the, are you Elijah, uh, the Messiah? Where would these um, expectations have come from? Are they just out of the blue? Um so yeah, maybe start with those. Yeah, so you know, John's popularity is just blowing up then at that time, and people coming out uh, uh, to the Jordan to be baptized from Jerusalem, coming out in droves, and this you know this concerns the religious establishment. They're afraid they're going to lose power, they're going to lose their followers to this John guy, and um, so it's not just the Pharisees that come out to talk and kind of. It's actually a delegation. It was priests, Levites, and Pharisees that came out uh, to basically see, like, who is this guy? What's he teaching? And is he safe? You know, is he dangerous? Um, so you know, the Pharisees they had um, uh, they'd been around since like the third century BC. They were actually a. They started out pretty much good because. Uh, as the Jews were getting Hellenized by the Greeks, which is kind of like uh, worldly, humanistic, even pagan influence, 
uh, the Pharisees started as a way to get back to the Word. Interesting. Yeah, they had a really good, really good start, and then over time, tragically, they became more and more adding laws, legalism, and you know, kind of uptight, self righteous religion. So that's just a little, little bit about the Pharisees. Yeah, Boromir and Lord of the Rings, right? Started out good, and then just got it's true. Mm-hmm. Missed the missed the purpose. Um, all right, so that's where they're from, and they're asking him all these questions. Uh, would these have been a lot of questions, though, that uh, everyone was asking? Like, would their questions of, uh, are you this guy, are you this guy? Um, or is that was that just probably in their books? Well, yeah, I mean, there was such a Messiah expectation at that mm-hmm. time. Like, we might think that there's a lot of, like, prophets today, and there's a lot of... Um, hype about the end times and Armageddon and doomsday stuff. Well, there kind of was then too. Mm -hmm. And there had been, what do they call that? Like the 400 silent years after Malachi is written. And so that, that sort of just heightened the expectation like Messiah, is he coming? He is coming when, if they knew anything about Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, they had a math. If they were literal in their math, they knew it was kind of close to the first century that Messiah could come. So yeah, there was a lot of expectation and a lot of so-called false messiahs that were raising up mm-hmm. self-proclaimed people um, that sort of fueled that whole um, you know, mindset. Yeah, and I want to get back to that uh, kind of the modern day false messiah here in a little bit because I think it's fascinating to think about what a, you know, how a prophet is perceived. Uh, and nowadays, but before that, we want to get to John the Baptist's response uh, to them. Um, were they satisfied? Were the Pharisees satisfied with John the Baptist's answer? I don't think they, they were, but I don't know really what would have satisfied them. Uh, I know that they're seeking. I think it's easy to give the Pharisees a bad rap. I mean, in society, we culturally, you know, when we make a negative reference, we tend to say it's a Pharisaical way of, of living, and we mean that in a, in a negative sense. But I think about John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, he he was devout, he worshiped the Lord. Uh, we know from reading through the Gospels there were Pharisees that accepted Christ. So I don't know, I, it's hard to say what were they thinking, but there could have been some in their group that, that really were seeking, and they really wanted an answer, and they, they, they loved God, and they, they were hoping, I don't know, I, yeah. I could be projecting that on there but there's part of me that goes I, there were those that that were, were true worshipers of the, of the living god and they had this like you said heightened expectation i i think they were hoping for something and i think it, it probably confused them or threw them for, for a loop when john didn't give them what they wanted mm-hmm. so a side note would you guys kind of collectively say pharisees as a whole get more of a bad rap than probably they should obviously there's a lot of bad apples but maybe a reminder that there were some that eventually did see the light more than that are recorded in the Gospels. Yeah, all you have to do is read Matthew 23 and what Jesus says to the Pharisees to get a perspective on on, on what they were like. Like, it's a scathing rebuke. Like, mm-hmm. it's brutal. And and yet we know that not every single one of them fit into that category. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, I, I think the Pharisees they might have liked John's answer the first day, but the second day, the first day, all he said was, "Hey, I'm just a voice of one crying." In the He's just quoting from the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. He's quoting from Isaiah. They're probably like, "All right, yeah, we're waiting for him too." And then the next day is when Jesus shows up, and John the Baptist says, "Behold, the Lamb of God," yeah. and he's going to take away sin. And he's going to baptize people in the Holy Spirit. And that's when they're like going, "We do not agree." with that. Right. And it's actually those two phrases that I, I want to talk about. So voice in the wilderness, I think voice in the desert, and then Lamb of God. Um, okay. Would those mm-hmm. have been kind of phrases that uh, Pharisees and other people that are hearing would have understood? Or were those like brand new terms that John the Baptist no, was bringing? Like Mark said, that, that phrase voice in the desert, that's a quote from Isaiah uh, 40, verse 3. And I thought it was, it was interesting, and Mark, you touched on this in your message, but a commentary put it this way about that, that phrase. It says, the idea is taken from the practice of the Eastern monarchs who, whenever they 
entered upon an expedition or took a journey, especially through the desert, unknown countries. They sent people ahead to prepare all things for their passage, to pioneer and open the passes, level the ways, remove all the impediments. So culturally, they would have gotten that. So it's it's pretty profound because it's in that spirit of all the things that, that John could have said, and especially right after they ask him to categorize, where are you coming from? What what paradigm do you fit in? And part I, I wonder if that would have just blown them away mm-hmm. for him to make that reference because it's pretty powerful. I mean, that there, there's so many, I mean, you can geek out over this and go a lot of layers with it, but um, there's... There's so many people that dive into just Isaiah 40 and what did it mean at that time and 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 how would this play out in their culture and but so they would have been very familiar with it and I think that's that's very cool in light of like what you said over the weekend you made this huge point about John just going hey I'm I'm just laying it down for who's coming mm-hmm. and you don't don't make it about me don't try and put a label on it I think sometimes when we can label things we feel better about it we have a hard time walking in the mystery of of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. So this is a really, really cool response to say voice in the desert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm such a, I mean, as we continue to unpack, I'm like, you know, a lot of people march to the beat of their own drum, but like that wasn't even John the Baptist because he marched to the beat <laughs> of another drum and it was not his drum. It was Jesus's. It was not a drum that a lot of the other people listening would have responded to. And like the confidence that he had in knowing how accurate and how true he was to be to that just allowed him to say these things and it yielded responses. And he's just like, you're dealing with it. Like I'm saying what I'm supposed to say and I'm laying out for who I'm supposed to lay out for. So it's cool because also sometimes we we're not willing. We want to go with the flow. We want to have the label. We want to go with very traditional or I don't know, conform with the mold and the norm. And it's just interesting throughout scripture, how God uses people willing to go out on a limb and then they get certain privileges like for him (laughs) behold the lamb of god takes away the sins of the world Mm -hmm. you know he gets joked about as you said mark and oh he's a guy wore camel's hair and ate locusts and social outcast and all this stuff got to announce jesus it's pretty awesome Mm -hmm. so so it reminds me sometimes that it's like if you want to live a radical life and see radical awesome things happen and you want to see the Holy Spirit move in your life, and you want the reality of God to increase tenfold. I almost think, well, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to trust? Willing again? Are you willing to trust the Lord? Are you willing to do what others might not do? Because sometimes it's only those that are willing to do what others won't do that are going to see maybe some really special things of the Lord. And I believe we talked about this last week, uh, confirming he probably never actually interacted with Jesus, correct? He says that, right? I, I didn't know it's, him. It's hard, yeah, but it's hard for me to believe that because yeah. of the relationship of, of their moms yeah. as Potential relatives. relatives. And, and that when he says that, I think what most scholars believe, hey, I, I didn't know him until, I didn't recognize him until, that he's referring more to him as Messiah. Okay. And that wasn't until the actual baptism and then the voice of God told him, you mm-hmm. know. And he saw the dove, the Holy Spirit, descend yeah, on him. That's such a family-based culture. It's hard mm-hmm. to think their kids wouldn't have right. spent time together. And the fact that Mary yeah. meant to spend time, yeah. spend time with her, I would have thought that that would have continued. I mean, John's parents likely died not too long after John was born because mm-hmm. they were quite elderly. So, you know, that throw... And then, you know, in Luke one eighty, it says that he was raised in the wilderness. So somehow, he 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 got, he went out to the wilderness. Whether he was raised by the Essenes, which was one of the three major Jewish groups: Pharisees, Essenes, and Sadducees, or somehow he had some connection out in the wilderness, and that's basically where he lived until he started baptizing and started ministering. Reminds me in some ways of how Paul started started his ministry, where he just was kind of removed from things mm-hmm. and spent a bunch of years making tents and. Yeah. And, and then was launched. Anyways. Well, uh, actually, real quick, it's kind of switching gears a little bit now to, to modern day. How many years have you guys served in ministry, <laughs> been in ministry? I'm going to come back. I'm going to guess a combined. Oh, combined? Well, or no, like, like, I together, mean, like uh, no, together. Like, uh, no. So, you, how many years have you served in ministry? How many years have you served in ministry? Define the beginning. 
When, when, when that would your be a- first time volunteering at a church. Whoa. Oh, man, I'm going to have to get out my calculator. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like serving with Noah, too? Was that... <laughs> no, just... So like 40 years for me. 40 years? All right. Yeah. Yeah, probably, probably the same for me. Uh, no, probably, probably about 30 years for me. Okay, 30, 40 years. Uh, all, that, all that to say is that you guys have seen a lot in ministry, no doubt. I mean, um, and in that, you've probably seen a lot of people that have come and uh, uh, said that they have prophecies from the Lord, and it's been true. And a lot of people that have said they have prophecies from the Lord or that they are the Lord, uh, they are the second coming, and it has been, uh, been false. Um, so I kind of want to spend a few minutes on what a modern day kind of John the Baptist would be uh, received. Um, so, well, first off, Mark, let's start with John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Aside from the Pharisees, his perception by people, it would have just been, he was, he was probably weird. Was he respected? And we've oh. talked about the weird, we beat that to a pulp, <laughs> but he was respected. Dude, in Mark 1, it says that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to get baptized and to confess their sin. Now, wow. that doesn't mean every single person in Jerusalem, <laughs> but like when, when Mark says like all the people, like, like that's a lot of them. And, and so he had, a, he had a huge respect for what he was doing. People wanted to, um, to hear him, to respond, to get ready for Messiah. We don't, I don't fully understand all that was going on there. Uh, and, and his baptism is a different kind of a baptism than our baptism today. Um, but, and, and let me just quickly say this, prophecy has two, two ways of going here. There's foretelling and forthtelling. So, so uh, what John was doing a lot of was just um, forthtelling, sharing the word of the Lord, calling people to repent. So there's a sense of like prophetic, like get your lives right, um, um, Get right for Jesus. And then there's uh, um, foretelling, which is predicting the future. I think a lot of people just think of that aspect of prophecy. Right. So when you ask that question, and if we're going to talk here for a couple minutes, it's probably good that we yeah. we get on those two pages because both have legitimacy, mm-hmm. although I think the uh, foretelling is is much more controversial. Yeah, and, and that's a really good distinction. Um I was, yeah, because there are people that really say, hey, you know, the, the spiritual gift of prophecy, the Lord gave me a word to give to you. Um, and that's very encouraging and very powerful in building up of the body of Christ. But I'm thinking about modern day prophets and the foretelling. They walk up to the church and they say, you and your pastors need to repent. You're doing this. This is going to happen. Not generally received well, I think, by the mm-hmm. ch- church culture. And yeah. I'm. Yeah, I mean, there, and there's, there's debate today about the office of a prophet is or is there an office of a prophet today or is there just the gift of prophecy forth telling i think what's difficult uh, with what you're saying trying to apply john the baptist in any kind of old testament ish prophetic work today you compare what mark was saying that intertestamental period that was kind of concluding with jesus and, and with john the baptist and that day there was a, a super cultural understanding that was how god had worked very commonly through old school, 100% died in the wool, prophets, the office of prophet. Our culture today is different. It's, it, that's not necessarily the norm. So I'm not making any huge conclusive statement on that, but it's definitely not the norm for, I think, most, most believers. And then also, I think with all gifts of the Spirit, they work best in relationship and community. So for me, when someone comes up and approaches me and says, I have something to tell you from the Lord, it's received best when I know that person walks with the Lord. Uh-huh. I mean, we can see when you read through the, the major and minor prophets in the Old Testament, you know, there's drama for sure, lots of drama. But these are people that walked with the Lord. It was a clearly established. There's no debate that they held that office. Someone just comes up to me and doesn't know me at all, and, and especially if they bring an antagonizing, brutal message. Listener else kind of thing. Well, and I'll tell you, I will still take it and pray about it. Mm. But as far as how do I receive it, do I think they're crazy? Do I think they're nuts? Um, kind of how I feel about them doesn't really matter. I'm still going to pray about it, but I'm telling you, it's going to be received a lot better. If you come up to me and you say, Michael, I, 
I don't even know how to explain this, but the Lord really put this on my heart for you. And I need to tell you this. That's That gets my attention because I know you walk with the Lord. And I know you desire to hear from the Lord. So that that's a validator for me. That, 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 that's like a reference. That's like an Amazon review <laughs> that's <laughs> telling me I, I should take this serious because this is coming from Tim. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I always get a little nervous when someone says, I have a word of the Lord for you or the okay. Lord told me you need to do this. Um, same with Michael. I'm going to take it seriously in that it, it, it could be, could be from the Lord. And, but, but when someone words it that way, they're putting that prophecy on the same level of scripture, I believe. Because they're 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 speaking in an authoritative "thus says the Lord" way, and their the, the means, the medium, in my way of thinking, it's way too subjective. Because how can they know for sure that their word is from the Lord? And in my mind, it's way uh, more wise and more accurate. And actually, as Michael was saying, I think more relational to say, "Hey." Um, I believe the Lord has, has prompted me to share something. This is this is for you to pray about. It's not a thus says the Lord. It's just like, I think that he's given this to me. Pray about this. Take a look at this. Rather than sometimes people use this stuff as a club and they want to mm-hmm. beat, yeah. uh, beat uh, spiritual abuse and authority trips. Sometimes people, maybe they think they, they are on a level of a prophet. And, um, you know, remember what the Old Testament says about prophets? They got to be 100% right. <laughs> and if they're not, they should die. So I don't know if anyone really wants the title prophet. Right. I mean, it's like, yeah. we, we, it's funny. No one wants to apply that part of it today, right? Right. You'd be drawing yeah. the, stro- the short straw. be like, I don't want it. You want it. Yeah. No, I don't want it. Yeah. But I really, again, back to the, so that's, so that's the foretelling. The fourth telling, I love what, what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, that prophecy is uh, words of comfort, words of encouragement, um, and words of edification. So that that's like um, a great way to prophesy to people, and just to share words of comfort, words of encouragement. We're not predicting the future necessarily, or dates, or you know, <laughs> which what you need to do. Give me your car mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, For the full prophecy, give me nine ninety nine <laughs> and ten short payments. Yeah, right. I'll tell you, Tim. I, Again, how, how people carry themselves when they do that is a big deal. Mm-hmm. I had one time, um, I have a friend who I believe 100% has prophetic giftings, and I've watched him minister before, and I was actually on a mission trip, so I'm in Europe, I'm in Italy, and there's a friend of mine that was really hurting, and I just felt led to ask this friend. I had called him and said, if I if I get someone on the phone with you, would you, would you prophesy? Would you, you know, fourth, would, but would you, would you, pray over them and the person agreed to do it and how they carried themselves in that moment was so cool because the whole time like almost like what you just said the whole time it's like hey all glory to the lord i'm going to just do my best i'm going to pray over you what comes out is going to you know you have to test this I'm not you know i'm going to so super humble guidelines ahead of time was like you know i'm not you know not giving glory to self at all and mm-hmm. then i literally I, I listened to my I listened to this conversation it was on speakerphone when my friend in America was praying over my friend in Italy, and I'm like, I know my friend's story and the pain he's going through, and I'm like, tears coming down my eyes, going, this guy in America is reading his mail and there was nothing of the scenario, and he is just, and it was so like, God focused, God honoring, and even when he got done, the guys, the, my Italian friends, crying, and he's like. Man, I have no idea how you knew mm. that. And and his response is, glory to God. Take this, pray over it, test it. I just want to serve you. Mm-hmm. And with So for me, again, it's like, dude, what a way to carry a mantle. And so that just validates, it, validates it's any, even more because you go, wow, what, a, what an awesome, humble way to use a gifting of God. Yeah, amen. And that's very, mm-hmm. very powerful. We had a lot of good conversations in Life Group about it too. And I think the Holy Spirit obviously is literally like moving in that and i think that is going to be able to help you in your discernment trying to figure out who this person's coming mm-hmm. where they're coming from uh i think the holy spirit is either going to give you peace or kind of throw red flags and say get out of there this person's about ready to get you in a pyramid scheme or something so um <laughs> awesome well i appreciate that and so now 
I kind of want to take the, the last few minutes. Um, Michael, swing on this one back to you. So this is the testimony of John the Baptist, and I think it would do us well and the listeners. Um, talk about testimonies for a little bit. So um, baseline question, why are testimonies, our personal testimonies, so powerful? And then maybe even for both of you, what are some words of encouragement um, for somebody who would say, I have a boring testimony or uh, I don't really have a testimony. And, you know, I just grew up in church and that's it. What do you guys say to that? Yeah, I think in our culture, we decide almost on the daily things that we're going to, places we're going to eat. Um, we decide where we're going to take our car for repair, um, what dentist we'll go to. We talk, we look for a third party endorsement. And I made the Amazon joke earlier, but it, that's just so culturally appropriate. You go on Amazon, you're trying to decide what to buy. What do you do? Well, how, what are the number of reviews they have? And what's mm-hmm. the star rating? Okay, 4.5 stars out of five. Great, I'm gonna go with it. So that we're just we're a people that wants a test wants to hear testimony, testimonials. How did it go? So what's so cool here is is you know, John the Baptist gives us this awesome testimonial validator of Christ. And as Mark said, he's making such a splash, such an impact on the culture. Like, is there a like more powerful in a sense? Like, what a powerful way for him to endorse John the Baptist and or for John the Baptist to endorse Christ. And yeah, so for us today, I think it's essential. Our testimonies are huge. Uh, because if we can't tell someone what Jesus has done for us and the life change that we've experienced, why would they even be enticed to uh, inquire or want to know more about the Lord? It's like if, if being a Christian makes no difference in my daily life, it's not altered my existence, then why would someone even care to hear about it or come mm-hmm. to church with me or want to hear about Christ. So we have to live openly, um, openly passionate about Christ. This is real. This changes me. I am nothing without the Lord. Like this has to be just our cry on the daily. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah, man, I, I, uh, I, I don't even know how many like life group meetings I've been in all fellowship gatherings, home groups, small groups, care groups, men's groups, um, not women's groups, uh, <laughs> not even one. No. Um, <laughs> and there's something about story. There's mm-hmm. something about opening up your heart and being vulnerable that, that brings God's people like closer together. It, sometimes it's like, it's subjective. It's hard to even like quantify what's going on. I mean, I can take a stab at it. I, I think when people, um, who, who, and it's interesting because so often it's like, well, if they really know my story, like they won't have me. Mm-hmm. Even though maybe they've already heard some crazy stories in the group, it's still something about them and their story. They're like, no, I can't share this and actually still be accepted here. And, and, and then they do, and they're loved and accepted. And it's like this, wow, I'm known now and I'm okay. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so encouraging. And, and then it's so inspiring, as Michael was saying, there's a sense in which that that becomes a, a way of inspiring and encouraging other people in the group. Isn't Revelation that says they overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the and by the word of their testimony? So there's something that's that's that leads to spiritual victory when we hear each other's stories. It's like, man. I believe God even more because of what he's done in Tim's life. Like, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Well, and it can't be denied. Right. Like, I can say, I disagree with you, but I can't say, no, Mark, that that didn't happen to you. (laughs) Yeah. And you weren't encouraged by it or you weren't healed. Right. And you're like, no, I was. Like, I can't argue against that. Yeah. So in some senses, this overcoming potential each one of us has inside of us that's only, you know, done through faith in Jesus, we have this like secret weapon that we so often refuse mm-hmm. to use. It's like, well, no wonder the gospel loses ground so often when Christians are silent about the secret yeah. weapon, the thing right. that God's done in their life, you know? Well, and, and another thing, it, this might sound, sound a little strange, but it helps you empathize with people. Like, you might, maybe you might wonder, like, that person, maybe they're a little closed, or maybe they're they they feel um, uh, like they're not quite 
maybe accepted or whatever it might be. And then that day they actually tell a little bit of their story and you realize where they've come from. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, my heart really goes out to them and look how far they've come, you know, mm -hmm. and now I understand maybe why they have some of the struggles that they do. So, um, that's a, I think that's a huge part of it also. I might have shared this on Digging Deeper before, but I was in a conversation with Rachel and Natalie, I believe, and I think it might have been Natalie who said it, but they're talking about this idea of, uh, so, you know, when it comes to worshiping, you have reserved worshipers, uh, then you have people that are very charismatic and they're worshiping, they are, uh, they're on their face during worship and they are just maybe even dancing. And some people have a strong temptation to be like, Geez, what did they drink or what did they sniff before? <laughs> but I forget which one of the ladies said it, but it's like, who are we to know what they've been delivered mm -hmm. from? Like, who who are we to say, like, what God has brought them from in their life? And what, like, we don't know their testimony. 100%. I bet if you walked up to them and said, why are you like this? Because a year ago, I was inches away from death and a drug deal, and now I'm here worshiping the Lord. So that idea of empathizing with people, it's so powerful where mm -hmm. you're just, for whatever reason, we're like, why are you acting the way you are? Well, that's that principle of being, for, you know, he who is forgiven much loves much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like Matt Redman in in one of his books. I think he he this is from the Unquenchable Worshipper, but he talks about you know the the woman who broke the alabaster jar and, and anointed Jesus. And he goes, why is it that we tend to worship Jesus with like a dropper? <laughs> 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 and and here we see extravagant worship where someone's like, I'm willing to to take a year's worth of wages and dump it, you know, and give it to Jesus because I'm forgiven much. So mm -hmm. I'm going to love much and worship much. And we just tend to just, I'll give a drop at a time for what? Cause that person might look at me and, and I think mm -hmm. it, it, it's like, number one, we can't worry about what other people say. Number two, I think we need to, in our own private time with the Lord, like stare the grace of Jesus in the face and go, what does it mean to me that I'm forgiven? And who would I be without Christ? I think when like you wrestle with that, you see the reality of it, that should fuel your worship. That should fuel your your time with the Lord on the daily and your time with your life group and just living openly passionate about God is because you can't help it. Like there's no choice. It's not right. like you choose to turn it on or turn it off. You're just like, I'm genuinely grateful. Like mm -hmm. I'm genuinely in love with my wife. <laughs> you know, I don't turn it on or off. I just am. And so we need to be that with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right on. Um, one more bit on testimonies. I believe uh, Pastor Tyler wrote this blog, and if I can talk to the powers that be, maybe getting that in the link in our, our newsletter, uh, five lessons from a boring testimony, I think, <laughs> is what it was, or something mm -hmm. like that. And a really powerful, really cool blog, and I've mentioned it a few times, so <laughs> I'm doing our resources early. But before we get to uh, uh, resources... Well, just piggyback on that real yeah. quick. I think that's... that's I've, I can't tell how many times I've heard... Oh, my testimony's boring. And, and you know... It is kind of a double-edged um, sword in the sense that, like, on the one hand, why do we think it's boring? <laughs> right. Like, somehow we're missing the miracle of conversion, mm -hmm. like the miracle that, that my soul got saved, yeah. whether I was a little kid or, or, or old later in life after a bunch of hard knocks. Either way, it's a miracle. So I guess the more, I mean, the more prophetic uh, answer I would give is, are you bored? Like, like maybe that's why, maybe that's why your testimony is boring. Like you're bored right now. So that'd be the thing as far as look inside. Yeah. But then the Tyler blog, I think he, if I remember that he gets into, I mean, isn't that what we want for all of our kids? Amen. We want them to have a boring Jesus. testimony. <laughs> like, like it's kind of the result of like, like do life the way the Bible says, godly parenting, kids ministry, youth ministry, right. you know, follow the Lord. And so in that respect, you know, it, it, praise God, it can potentially avoid, uh, you know, some of the shipwrecks mm -hmm. and the heartaches of life. And so it's like, I, I, I hey, praise God, praise God, you have a boring testimony, but don't think of it as a boring testimony because right. there's no such thing. I think it's only a fail if somebody is pious, back to our Pharisaical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're like, well, I have never blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, that's not cool. But, but the idea that someone could testify. I didn't have to go through that. Yeah. Praise God. We should all, like you said, for our kids, we wish it, they would, our kids would not have to go through some of the things that we've stumbled. We would want to so save true. them that. Uh -huh. so, so to true. me, it's like, it's not boring. It's inspirational. And if we hold that back, it's like, we want to show to someone that's going, does it work to follow Jesus? Does it work? 
and we want to say it works. Mm -hmm. Life's mm -hmm. not perfect because he didn't say it would be perfect. Mm -hmm. He said there would be trouble, but take heart of overcome the world. So it's like, let's show you how it's worked in my life. Mm -hmm. And we need to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, well, God saving me wasn't that big of a deal because <laughs> I, I wasn't really all that bad. Like oh, just, just think about that. Like, I mean, I can understand sort of where that's Ooh. coming from, from a human perspective, but like, and then, sorry, we're probably spending more time on no, this. We're the, good. The, but the whole thing, and how, okay, let's say if when a person is miraculously, we see it all the time, person miraculously saved a drug addiction, mm -hmm. hell and back kind mm -hmm. of life. Um, awesome. Praise God. <laughs> miraculous. But to be protected from things like that are just as much of a praise right. about the supernatural power oh, of God. Amen. Because um, those that have been delivered from all of those things, it's like, the Lord forgives, the Lord redeems, but often the consequences from our journeys remain. Yeah. And and that's just a part of it. So, you know, you see someone, it's like, yes, I was delivered from this, 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 this. But here are these consequences that I mm -hmm. still, the Lord doesn't remove. I mean, he can, every once in a while he does. And she, there's mercy there, but he's not obligated to. Because especially so many times we we choose these things out of a rebellious heart. Not every time. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not our fault. Sometimes we choose to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Lord allows us to choose to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's consequences. That's a great word, gentlemen. Uh, Two-minute drill as we kind of wrap up. Uh, one last thing I want to learn from John the Baptist, though, before we get going. And this is something we talked about. We definitely want to share with the listeners. Um, John the Baptist, doing God's work, baptizing, uh, talking about the Messiah coming, but not necessarily knowing exactly when the Messiah would show up. Um, what is one way that this can be the most instructive to us as we are here in 2021? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll jump in. Yeah. I mean, I, I see a lot of comparison because we're awaiting the second return of Messiah. Mm -hmm. So we don't know when that's going to be, just like John didn't know when that was going to be. And so keep going. Stay faithful. Mm -hmm. Keep serving the Lord. Keep following the Lord. It's kind of That's sort of the, yeah. the, the, the takeaway for me. Definitely. Michael. Well, we're called to be people of faith. You know, we see it Old Testament, New Testament. We're called to faith. Well, faith isn't faith if you can see exactly how it's all <laughs> going to work out. Faith isn't faith if you know exactly when wow. Jesus is coming back, if you know exactly how Jesus will come through. So that's that tension. We have to live in the faith, but it's actually really, really good. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's not always easy, but it's good. So, you know, this is an awesome example of John the Baptist. Like you said, Mark, that we there's another coming that we await. And we need to live in that by faith and that and that good tension, knowing that, you know, we're doing this because we don't know when, um, because we can't. It's not. It's like almost like a guaranteed reward. It's like, well, we don't know when, but we're going to do it because we love so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep going. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, guys, resources that kind of are, are keep digging something that the, the listeners can keep chewing on. Do you guys have anything? This is kind of crazy, but I was going through some of my books found this book. It's called Great Personalities of the New Testament. And it's old, but it was my great grandmother's. Wow. So it's family heirloom. It's family heirloom. And I just think there's a lot of resources out there. I mean, but books like this sometimes are fun, you know, mm -hmm. that are surveys, survey the Old mm -hmm. Testament, survey the New Testament, uh, great women in the Bible, great men in the Bible, you know, great personalities. You can glean a lot from mm -hmm. resource books. Sweet. So I don't even know where I picked it up or, or somehow it ended up in my library, a book called The Prisoner in the Third Cell. The Prisoner in the Third Cell by a guy named Edwards. And it's a fictional account of John the Baptist, huh. based on the Bible, of course, and kind of his life. A quick read, but the, the cell, the prison cell thing is sort of how his life ends. Mm. And um, man, that just really moved my heart. It's a good, it was a good read. Um, what's a blessing, uh, as far as like help with sharing your testimony, there's a resource that we have. Actually, it's on our life group essentials booklet where we encourage life group leaders to share stories within the life group. And there's like one page in there and we, we'd be, uh, we'd love to, it's, it's just a really quick, some tips on how to share, how to develop a testimony. Uh, and one quick thing, um, uh, this season I've really been enjoying, it's called Harmony of the Gospels, which is, it's all four Gospels and how they fit together chronologically. 
And because I've been looking at John, of course, studying it deeply, and like, where does this fit in terms of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And you see things that are like, this is so interesting because um, it helps you get the whole history of what's going on and when. Um, one quick thing, for example, when in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when the disciples are first called by Jesus, that wasn't the first time. That was quite a ways into their relationship with Jesus. So they just drop their nets and leave, and leave everything to follow Jesus, and yet that was not the first time that they had interacted with Jesus. So you can see kind of the bigger picture, harmony of the Gospels, harmony of the Gospels. Or, or a chronological Bible. Yeah. That has the oh, gospels yeah. all kind of together. Yeah, those are fun. Yeah, I got one of those when I yeah. was growing up. It was I didn't realize what I had, and so I was like reading. It I was like, wait, <laughs> how did I get here? But no, great stuff. <laughs> I was a little dense uh, in high school, so <laughs> <laughs> didn't realize what a chronological Bible was until I realized. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you. joining me. Hopefully, it'll happen again. Listeners, I uh, hope that was just super encouraging for you guys. Uh, tune in next week. Got a got a good crew coming on. So. Gentlemen, until next time. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tim.